Okay, well, uh, first of all, I am Sister Elizabeth Hill. I am the president of St. Joseph's College, and it is my great delight to welcome all of you today to what is a very special day at St. Joseph's. Uh, and before I explain why it is a special day, I want to invite a very dear friend uh, to begin our ecumenical program. And so I'd like to ask Monsignor Edward Breen, who is a dear friend of both Dr. Riza and Mrs. Khatib, and I'll tell you more about them later, but I'd like to ask Monsignor Breen to invoke God's blessing on all here present and the wonderful work that the rabbi is doing. Monsignor, would you help us? Sure, Tessis and all of you, you don't have to worry, I will not be long, <laughs> very quite definitely, uh, at that age in life. I'm very, very happy to be here and suggest that in our invocation, we kind of open our arms and open our hearts to listen to God, and in a certain sense, to listen to one another, to be aware of the blessing of being able to do something like this with the rabbi here today. One of the things which struck me, and I looked at my sister, my sister had gone to college here, and I was looking at the booklet which they have, and there was something in it, I'm just going to use that as an introduction. One of the opening sentences says, the city we have where we have chosen to live should be a city uh, to celebrate understanding. Telephone that. Begin with knowledge of different things. That's a very, very important thing. Begin with knowledge of different things. When my sister and Georgiana were here, the people are much too young. St. Joseph's College for Women. That's right, yes. Now St. Joseph's College for people men and women, and that's a wonderful thing. And so it is very, very important to have something like this, and very, very important they're aware of that. And one of the things which they're aware of in having a lecture series like this, to, left, to leave behind something which take track of all of the things which overcome things like bigotry and discrimination, and one of the most important things is knowledge. So the idea of having Something like this is to create knowledge. And they have a different speaker every year. And the rabbi this year will be able to explain that. This was originally a Catholic college and originally just for women. Shh. I think we have some men here now, men and women. And it is people of both different tradition. And it's very, very important to remember that. So let us pause for a moment. We tell God that we will try to be open to the inspiration which we receive from this talk, the inspiration which we receive from the course which is here, the inspiration which we receive from one another, from all the people which we eat here, that we meet here. We're thankful for it. We ask God to bless all of us as we ask all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Monsignor. Uh, you always get us off to a good start, and that was very lovely. We appreciate it very much. And as I said earlier, today is a very special day at St. Joseph's College because it is the occasion of the fourth Khatib Lecture. And that's a series that has been made possible, as Monsignor just indicated, by the great generosity of Dr. Riza and Georgiana Clifford Khatib. Uh, Georgiana is a graduate of St. Joseph's College for Women, as was I. And we are very proud and honored to have been the recipient of an endowment that they have given us that enables us to bring a representative of a different faith and a different religious tradition to our campuses each spring to teach a class and to deliver a major lecture. And again, to echo what Monsignor Breen just said, the goal of the Khatib Chair, going back to when we were first starting to talk about it, is to provide intellectual insight and also promote emotional understanding among people who profess different faiths. You know, as we all know, our world right now is a fractured one. And not a day passes that we don't hear of another tragedy that was rooted in the hate of one person for another just because that person was different. So we desperately need to find ways to eliminate that hate, which is rooted in fear, which in turn is rooted in ignorance. And that is why the education and the instruction of which Monsignor Breen just, just adverted, is so absolutely essential. And that is why the Khatib Chair is St. Joseph's 
way of doing that, a way of addressing that issue of trying to root out the fear, uh, which is rooted in the ignorance, and that eventually leads to the violence and the terrible things that we seem to do to each other. And so I think it is most appropriate that we have this lecture <clears throat> in the spring semester, because that is a time of hope and new life and new beginnings and optimism. It is also quite appropriate that the Khatibs should be the sponsors of this effort here at St. Joseph's College, because as I say each year, they themselves model the way and the very spirit of understanding, respect, and love for which we are all striving. In their personal lives, as most of us know, they unite two of the major religious traditions, Islam and Roman Catholicism. And they have dear friends who embrace other faiths, including Judaism. And we are blessed and honored to have many of them with us today. Welcome again. It's good to have you back. Because they are committed to the effort to bring peace and unity into the chaos of our contemporary world, they show us through their own lives that it is possible to build bridges and to live in harmony. And so today and every day, we thank them certainly for their generous gift, but even more for the inspiration they provide for all of us. I have been very specially privileged and fortunate to have had the opportunity to get to know them and love them as dear friends, and they are a real blessing in my life. And so please join me in expressing our appreciation for Dr. Reza and Georgiana Khatib and all they are doing for St. Joseph's College. Thank you. Dr. Khatib, would you like to say a few words? Would you like to say a few words? Come up, come up. Risa, come, come, come. Yeah. They won't hear you if you don't. <laughs> I would like to thank Sister and St. Joseph College. And uh, I would like all of you for coming. And uh, I would like to see for many years to come the same function that has been going on for past three years. And this is the fourth year of it. And Sister, I. Thank you very much. I thank you, Reza. Thank you. God bless you. And I thank you very much. And Georgie, those are for you. <laughs> <laughs> just, a, just a little bouquet of flowers. <laughs> and now it is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, the 2012 holder of the Khatib Chair in Comparative Religions. Rabbi Gary Breton Granitor is a recognized expert in interfaith relations, a well-known lecturer, author of numerous articles, and the editor of two books. So right away, we know we are in good company. Rabbi Gary, Gary is currently the Vice President for Philanthropy at the World Union of Progressive Judaism. And the World Union is exactly what it says it is. It's a worldwide organization that strives to nurture communities that are based on the principles of Jewish life and tradition, as well as pluralism, and innovation. He has also served as director of the Education Division of the Anti-Defamation League, and his mission in that position was to end prejudice, bias, and anti-Semitism through education. And you are beginning to see why he is a perfect fit for the Khatib chair. In that last position, Rabbi Gary did amazing things, among which were he represented the ADL at an international Catholic Jewish liaison committee, he delivered a major address for a Muslim, Orthodox Christian, and Jewish conference on peace and the Olympic spirit, and that happened to be in Athens. Poor thing, he had to go to Athens. <laughs> and he gave an address at the 40th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, one of the major documents of the Second Vatican Council at the Gregorian University in Rome. I really think Rabbi Gary knows more priests than I do, and he certainly knows more bishops and cardinals. <laughs> The rabbi is a graduate of the New York campus of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, and he was on the faculty of the Religion and History Departments of Sarah Lawrence College. He has also been a lecturer at NYU School of Continuing Education and a member of the faculty of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion School of Education, where he specialized in intertestamental in literature and Jewish ethics. That's hard to say. Now this represents just a tiny portion of the rabbi's resume, and I really could go on and on about his background and accomplishments, but you have come to listen to him, not about him. So suffice it to say that we've been very fortunate to have had Rabbi Gary Breton Granitor with us this semester, and I'm delighted to present him to you today. Rabbi.
I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here today in this wonderful position. I thank Georgie and Riza for what they have created. It will continue to mark your contribution, not just to this institution, but to every student, every person who's been able to be enlightened and lifted up by the people who have been brought here in order to expand our world and our understanding. Monsignor Breen, thank you for a beautiful beginning. We are here to learn. And as Sister has pointed out, we all know that hatred begins with prejudice, and prejudice is rooted in ignorance. And if we want to end hatred and prejudice, we have to get at the taproot, and we have to get at eradicating ignorance. And the only way we can do that is by opening up our hearts, our souls, and our minds, and listening and hearing one another. So I am deeply honored to be here. I also am so grateful to the two of you because I now feel that I have a new family. Uh, St. Joseph's College has been so welcoming to me. I've adored every minute of working with Sister Elizabeth, with the faculty, the staff, Tom Petriano, and my students. And it really is a wonderful experience. My wife knows what day I'm teaching because she says, I bound out of bed that morning. And she said, oh, you must be going to teach today. So uh, I am really delighted to be here. It is indeed an honor. I want to talk about something that most people don't know about. In fact, I would suggest that most average Catholics don't know about this, and yet it is so deeply rooted in your tradition. The Second Vatican Council, which was concluded in 1965, actually was started in 1962-63 with the express desire on the part of Roncalli, who was also known as Pope John XXIII, who was probably the model for the Santa Claus. Um, if you ever saw Roncalli, he's about this big and about wider, um, often wore big, wide-brimmed hats. But Roncalli understood that there was a need to transform Catholic-Jewish relations and to change a 1,700-year history. He wanted to try to repudiate the ancient Christian charge against Jews as Christ killers and reaffirm God's eternal covenant with the Jewish people. Now, how did that happen? Why was he the person who wanted to do this? How did it occur? What has happened in the years following? And what impact has it made and has yet to make? Roncalli understood that the time had come for the church to reform itself. It had to. World War II had come and gone. The horrors of the Second World War, not just for Jews, but as the Nazis' targets were not just Jews, they were Roma, otherwise known as gypsies. They were people who had uh, handicaps and challenges. They were people who were considered by the Nazi the other. The world had weathered that dark moment. The church had looked at itself, tried to understand what it did and did not do in those years. And in those years, there was a remarkable change that was going on, not just in the world in general, but in the Jewish world as well, because at the, with the embers, the dying embers of the Second World War was the birth of Israel and the re-beginning or the renewal of the Jewish people in this new time. All of these things came to be. And Roncalli understood that the time had come in 1962 to change. But I want to take a step back and look at what I consider to be six stages of Catholic-Jewish relations that led up to that moment and try to understand what led Roncalli to call the Second Vatican Council into being, what went on during those three contentious years, and what the fruits are that were born of that moment. So the first stage of Catholic-Jewish relations is during the time of Jesus' ministry until the destruction of the Second Temple. Now the students in my class understand that what was going on even prior to the birth of Jesus was not a unified Jewish community, but actually going back as early as 168 BCE, 
where the Maccabean revolt occurred, which is the uh, revolt that we celebrate, Jews celebrate during the festival of Hanukkah, which coincides often around Christmas time during the winter solstice. From 168 BCE, what was going on was the Jews who had heretofore been led by an agricultural point of view because they lived in an agricultural environment. And if one opens up the Bible, especially Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, one reads what ultimately is an agrarian document, a constitution of an agricultural people. The taxation was based upon the crops that you raised, the herds that you had. That's how people were taken care of. The poor, the widow, and the orphan were paid out of the largesse of people who owned land and owned flocks. Well, what happened after Alexander the Great came and forced the great diaspora, happened actually before, but Alexander the Great really changed things in 333 BCE. By 168 BCE, the children of Israel who were living in the environs around Jerusalem were challenged because their legal documents were written for an agricultural-based society, and yet they were living in a cosmopolitan setting. And they were living as a minority group under a Syrian Roman rule. And there was tremendous contention among the Jewish community as how they were going to relate to the power under which they lived and how do they relate to their founding documents, the Torah? How could they make it part of their lives? Jesus' life was lived during a time of great expansion and division within the Jewish community. There were people who said that the Torah as written could not be changed or interpreted in any way. They traced their heritage back to grand, the grandson of Aaron, whose name was Zadduk. They called themselves the Zadukites. And if you lived in a Greco-Roman world, Zadukites were called Sadducees. There were people who said the Torah was written for a different time and climate. And for us to understand our lives today, we must interpret this tradition. We must wrestle with it. We must play with it. Those people were called Perushim, the explainers. And if you lived in a Greco-Roman environment, they were called Pharisees. There was a great divide among Pharisees. There were Pharisees who believed simply that they were interpreting the law in order to make their lives in the moment real. And there were people who said, we wait for a coming of a time that God will show when the world will change because God's anointed will come and change it. Those were the apocalyptic Pharisees. There were a group of semi-monastic Jews who went off into the hills. They went off into places like Masada and the caves, and they were called the Essenes. There were other people. There were kind of inspired mystics, people like John the Baptist, who actually looked like Mr. Natural from the 1960s and 1970s Zap comics. Long, flowing white beard, long hair, walked around preaching that the end is near and that people needed to find salvation. These were part of the Jewish community as well. The Jewish community was not a unified community. It was a very fragmented community, one fighting with another as to try to figure out where was law? What was law about? What was salvation about? Where was healing going to come from? And Jesus was very much a part of that environment. And until the end of his ministry and until the time of the first destruction of the second temple in the year 70 CE, Jesus and his followers were for the most part well ensconced in this fractious, debating, roiling Jewish community. Paul, Saul originally, Saul from Tarsus, who then went on his treks, began to bring in people who were not part of the Jewish community. But the Jewish community with which Jesus himself was aware was his community. It was not a foreign community to him. The second stage. 
the parting of the ways, which begins around the end of the first century and lasts until about the fourth century, about 300 years. It is at this time, number one, that Paul has gone on to evangelize not just members of the Jewish community, because for a while he centered his, his concentration on the Jewish community. When he felt that he had gotten as many as he could from the Jewish community, he began his travels to other areas and began to evangelize the Gentile community, began to send letters to those communities, began to send letters from those communities, began a, a, a wider mission. And at the same time, what was going on in the environs of Jerusalem, and because of the destruction of the Second Temple, many of the Jews left and went to the north to places like Babylonia. And they went to other places where they encountered members of this nascent Christian church. There was, for a long time, people who were Hebrew Christians, or Jesus' followers within Jewish community. If you go, to the northern Galilee, and you go and visit Peter's church, the mother church, which is right near the shores of the Galilee, not a hundred yards away was a synagogue. And in fact, if you look at the village around there, there was not a Christian side and a Jewish side. They were all part of the same family. Often they would go from one place to another. They would go to Peter's church, they would go to the synagogue. They would be at the synagogue, they would go to Peter's church. Many people don't understand that, and, and I take people often on tours of Israel. I take them to the other side of the Galilee. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, the first agricultural settlement before the founding of the state of Israel was a kibbutz, kind of a socialist collective. The first one was called Daganya. After a while, there was a political debate among the members of Daganya, often within families. Brothers and sisters fought, cousins fought, and so there was a rift within Daganya. And if you travel to Daganya, if you turn left, you go into Daganya. If you turn right, you go into Daganya Bet, B, or number two. Why? Because even though there was going to be a split, they wanted to be near one another. They were still family. They visited one another. They were just from political differences. They, were from, they wanted to live their lives differently, but they were part of the same family. They weren't looking to make this huge rift. So from about the end of the first century until we get to the, third, the end of the third, beginning of the fourth century, there was very much this kind of beginning of the parting of the ways. But then you get somebody like Rabban Gamliel, one of the great rabbis, who takes one of the daily prayers that is said, which was called birkat minim, a blessing of the different kinds. Daily, we have to bless God for creating the diversity of the universe. Thank you for creating all the different flowers, all the different fruits and vegetables, all the different birds. Rabban Gamliel took that and split it in half. He said, okay, the first part of it is gonna be, thank you God for making all these different things and then he says, thank you, God, for making us us and them them, and begins the official parting of the ways, and says, if you are part of that community, you can't be part of this community. And if you're part of this community, you can't identify with that. And at the same time, we begin to see early patristic writings that kind of force this, this part this parting, Justinian and others. The third comes along with Constantine, the establishment of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Constantine declares in, three, in about 330, 332, declares Christianity as the state religion. Now in that he says, we need to leave the Jews alone because obviously Christianity finds its roots in some of their, the Jewish texts, but for the most part, there was increasing legislation which took away more and more rights of the Jewish community and established Christianity as the religion, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And I will take that period up until about the 10th century, which is the beginning of the Crusades. 
And the Crusades were the Christians who began to try to rid the world of the infidel. The original infidel was not the Jews, although they came several weeks later, um, pretty close. But the original Crusades were against the growing population of the Muslim community. And then they turned their attention to the Jewish world. So that's the uh, third stage. So with the Crusades, from the beginning of the Crusades, 10th century to the 16th century, we now see the imposition of what is church-based anti-Judaism from different teachings and different understandings of the New Testament, there is now a beginning of laws that are put in place based upon Christian scripture that we begin to see the teaching of contempt, meaning the Jews had a covenant with God, they abrogated it, they broke it, hence we have a New Testament. Testament is another word for covenant. So there was the Old Testament, meaning the Hebrew Bible, which is proof that the Jews had broken it because look at their oppressed state. Look, look at how they are persecuted. Look at where they are. That means they must be cursed. And the Christian church is the new Israel, the new church, the new covenantal partner with God. What God had established with Abraham and later ratified with Moses was broken because of the Jews' perfidy, their refusal to accept living in this new covenant, and we begin to see the teaching of the contempt, of contempt which leads to the ghettoization of Jews throughout Europe. We begin to see burning of the Talmudic text. The Talmud was the interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. And in town squares, Talmuds were thrown into a pyre and were lit on fire. It was the beginning of the blood libel where Christians would assert that Jewish blood was necessary in order to create Passover matzah and that, Jew that Christian children were being taken and slaughtered in order to create Passover matzah. And so therefore, Christians went on rampages, especially around Good Friday, against Jews, because Good Friday also often came around the time of Passover. Um, so you have this going on until about the 16th century. Then we get to the Enlightenment, the period of the Enlightenment to the Second World War. This is the fifth stage of Catholic-Jewish relations. By the time you get to the Second World War, leading up to the Second World War, the end of the 1800s, the early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, overlaid on top of church-based anti-Judaism is the birth of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is different than anti-Judaism. Anti-Semitism is a political overlay onto a theological Statement. So anti-Judaism is a theological bias against Jews and Judaism. Anti-Semitism is a use of politics in order to advance that. And so we begin to see, for example, if you look in, in German texts leading up to the Second World War, there was a great fascination with eugenics. The notion that the, the Germans could identify based upon the shape of one's head, the color of one's skin, the length of one's nose, the bridge of one's eyebrows, they can determine who was genetically superior and who was genetically inferior. And Jews and Negroes, according to Nazi literature, were considered akin to gorillas and apes. And therefore, once you get into the Second World War, decent people could easily be led astray and get involved in this wholesale and wanton destruction of Jews and Roma and people who have disabilities by being convinced that they were genetically superior and all they were doing was eradicating the inferior genetic seed that was out there that could potentially pollute this group of Ubermenschen, this, this great super society that was the Aryan class. This is where things turn. 
the end of the Second World War, people began to see how truly, truly evil human beings could be. And people began to call into account what they did and what they did not do. How they were involved. And responsibility is not necessarily if you picked up a gun, but if you picked up a phone, or if you opened a door, or if you said, those people next door are the people you're after. Or you didn't say anything. And throughout the late 40s, the early 50s, people, especially in Europe, began to look inward and to ask themselves if, in fact, they had done anything one way or another that contributed to it. The liberation of the death camps occurred. The establishment and the birth of the state of Israel so the Jewish people, like a phoenix, kind of arise again. And the church itself, the Catholic Church itself, begins this examination of conscience and renewal. Roncalli, in 1959, little Pope John XXIII, you're coming up on this next week. So the, this 1959, many years ago, Roncalli is preparing to lead Good Friday services. Now you know that at the Vatican, the Monsignori were there to serve, they, they, and they, they kind of like propagated like rabbits. There were lots of Monsignori. They were always following the Pope around, and um, they were, whatever, they, whatever the Pope needed, they were there to take care of it. And he was getting ready to lead Good Friday service, and he asks for the major prayer book that he was gonna be reading from. And they bring it back to a small room. And then he says, pen. He says it in Italian. And all the months in your eyes, what, 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 what do you want? I said, pen, pen. Popes don't keep pen. I have a pen in my pocket. I don't go anywhere without a pen. You don't go anywhere, you're, you're a doctor. You wouldn't go anywhere without a pen. Popes don't have pockets for pens. <laughs> Popes don't need pens. So he says, I want a pen. So all the little Monsignori scatter around. Somebody goes and finds a pen. And he takes the book. And he turns to the page of the Good Friday liturgy, which calls for the intercession that God bless the bishops and the cardinals and the priests and the catechumens and the people who are in the church and the people who are not part of our church, and, uh, but they, they are, they're believers and we all pick And then, it says, and we pray for the perfidious Jews who are blind to, to truth. And he takes the pen and he crosses it out and he says, basta, enough, enough. Because here contained in the liturgy is classical anti-Judaism. On a, not, a, not political, it's not anti-Semitism, it's anti-Judaism. It is an anti-Jewish point of view that's put in the mouth of theology. And he crosses it out and he says, enough already, this is 1959. He says, this cannot continue. Right after that, he greets a delegation of American Jews with the quotation from the biblical text I am Joseph, your brother, recalling when Joseph was in Egypt and his brothers came down from Judah to visit him. And he reveals himself having been disguised. And he says, I am Joseph, your brother. Roncalli welcomes the Jewish delegation saying, I am Joseph, your brother. He was Joseph Roncalli. He then directs one of the great saints of the church, Cardinal Augustin Baer, who at the time was the head of the Secretariat for Christian Unity. And he says, and this is 19, again, 1959, 1960 now. He says, prepare a text that would be a draft that we could study re-examining the relationship between the Jewish community and the Catholic Church. At the same time, the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Jules Itzik, began quiet 
off-the-cuff dialogue with Roncalli, with John the 23rd. The ADL at the time installs at Roncalli's invitation a Jewish scholar by the name of Dr. Joseph Lichten. He is the only Jew to this day to have had his own office in the Vatican, in Vatican City, which they, were, they provided, so that he could constantly talk to them about what changes needed to be made. One of my teachers, one of my dearest friends, Sister Rose Thering, another person who really ought to be um, sainted sometime soon, um, Sister Rose was, was born in like Oklahoma, in the backwoods. She was a teacher in the 1950s. She did her PhD text, her, her PhD thesis on Catholic religious school textbooks and how they portrayed Jews and Judaism. She was horrified to see one Catholic textbook after another vilified Jews and Judaism over and over again. And she began a letter writing campaign to Roncalli and the people in the Vatican saying, this stuff has to be changed. If, if you need to re-examine yourself, start with what you teach children in religious school. Sister Rose went on a remarkable career, uh, was constantly invited to the Vatican, um, was very involved with the Sisters of Zion, helped establish um, several convents in Israel um, and in Rome to continue this kind of dialogue. And she continued to live in New Jersey and, and taught in um, um, Catholic school in New Jersey. Um, just a remarkable, remarkable woman. So in 1962, Roncalli calls into being the Second Vatican Council. And it begins, his hope was the first thing that they would take up would be this document that Cardinal Bea had drafted on Jews and Judaism. It wasn't so easy. There was a lot of contention. There were a lot of arguments. There were a lot of bishops who were there who said, if you do this, it's going to change our relationship with the Muslim community. And many of us are representing the Catholic Church in countries where there's a Muslim minor, mi majority. You will put us in danger. You can't, you can't pass this document. There was lots of talk. So they decided to focus on other things. They dealt with all the other issues of the Second Vatican Council, whether you can pray in the vernacular, all sorts of things like this. Listen, I know this because I was a kid in Yonkers, New York, where I was one of six Jewish families. The rest were Catholics. My, my public school classroom cleared out most afternoons for catechism and the six Jewish kids you know, were hanging around and we had to twiddle our thumbs while all the other kids were released from public school to go to catechism class. My first uh, girlfriend, Betty Ann Jones, <laughs> after, after Vatican II uh, was concluded, came and said, you know, we can continue to date. I heard that you're not responsible for the death of Jesus. <laughs> I, I didn't think I had hurt anybody. So. Uh, it goes on. In fact, Roncalli dies during the process, and a new pope comes, Montini. You know him as Paul VI. October 28th, 1965, the very last document to be voted on in the Second Vatican Council was a text called Nostra Aetate, which means in our times. Originally, it was meant to be a text simply on the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Jewish community. They had to expand it. So it's about the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Protestant community. It's the relationship between the Catholic Church and the unchurched. It's the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Muslim community. And it's the fourth article, 14 long lines in Latin is about the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Jewish community. October 28th, 2,221 bishops voted for, 88 bishops voted against. And Montini, Pope John VI, as his final act of the Second Vatican Council, signed Nostra Aetate into being. You all have a text of it. Um, I gave you Chapter 3, which is about the 
church's relationship with the Muslim community. I'm going to circle back and talk about that towards the end. But if you look at closely, and we don't, we're not going to go through it. I'm not going to parse it all. I'm going to tell you, you can take it home with you. These 14 lines do four critical things. Four critical things. The first is, it says unequivocally, Jews living at the time of Jesus and Jews now and Jews of every age, whether before or after, cannot be held responsible for the death of Jesus. So it is rescinding the deicide charge. Jews cannot be called the killers of Christ. Jews were not responsible. It is a misunderstanding of what actually happened in Matthew 25 to say that they were responsible. Two. It says, Jews have a unique and ongoing covenant with God. Meaning that the covenant that the Jews had was not abrogated. It was not broken. The church grew and parallel tracks started to go in different directions. So the church may consider itself the new Israel, but that does not deny Israel's claim to a relationship with God. The third thing it says, the Jews have a unique path to salvation, meaning evangelizing Jews from the church is no longer part of the mission of the church. The Jews, we don't know, we can't explain it, but they have their own thing of salvation and they don't need to come through Christ to salvation, leave them alone. The fourth thing it says, Anti-Semitism is a sin. Four things. The deicide charge is rescinded. Jews have a unique and ongoing relationship, meaning supersessionism is now taken out. Jews have a unique path to salvation. And anti-Semitism is a sin. Now, obviously, this was very much a product of its time and very much a product of massive deliberations, massive compromises, it did not solve the whole problem. So in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, all of a sudden Jews wanted to get involved in dialogue with the Catholic Church. And as is the want of the Jewish community, every single Jew raised his hands or her hands and said, I'm the official representative of the Jewish community. And one delegation after another was going to the Vatican to have a conversation with the Pope and the Curia and to represent the Jewish community. This day, to this day, if a Martian beamed down to this planet and said, take me to the Jewish leader, every Jewish hand would go up except for one and say, I'm it. The one that wouldn't would be a little red-haired lady sitting in the back of the room. That would be my mother. And she would be saying, it's my son. <laughs> Everybody else says, I'm the representative of the Jewish community. After five years of this, from 1965 to 1970, the church puts up with one delegation after another and finally gets tired of it and said, you know what? If you want to talk to us, you know our telephone number. You know our address. You know the guy in charge. When are you guys going to figure out a central address so that we can respond instead of everybody saying you're it until somebody else comes along and say I'm it? So a unique institution in Jewish life was created in 1970, which was called itch kick. It sounds like and it behaved like a skin disease. <laughs> it stands for the International Jewish Coalition on Interreligious Consultations. I've been a member of it for years. It does act like a skin disease. It is where Jews come together, kind of put together, put aside their ego a little bit, not a lot, and for the sake of having a central address, considers itself the central spokesbody of the official Jewish world in dialogue with places like the Catholic Church, the World Council of Churches in Geneva, many of the Muslim institutions now, the Orthodox institutions, meaning your Orthodox institutions, not ours, because some of the Orthodox are part of Ichkik, believe it or not, are Orthodox. Um, so out of that ongoing relationship, 
was born the International Liaison Committee, where what came from the church, from Cardinal Bea, Cardinal Bea was running at the time, the, um, the Office of Christian Unity, there is a subset of that called the Pontifical Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews. Understand, there is an office of interreligious affairs within the Vatican, which deals with everybody else. But there is only one place that they deal with Jews and Judaism, and that is the Pontifical Com uh, Council on, uh, for Jews and Judaism. So the ILC, the International Liaison Committee, is made up of the members of the Pontifical Commission and Ichkik, and we meet together on a regular basis, about every two years now. But in 1975, they published jointly, or the Vatican actually published, the guidelines on how to interpret Noshkiratate. That wasn't good enough. In 1985, 10 years later, there's the notes on the guidelines on how to interpret Noshkiratate. Then there was the Pontifical Commission, Biblical Commission, writing on the Jewish people and their sacred literature. Because Wotia, who you know as John Paul II, felt that it was the Catholic world's obligation to understand Jewish scripture as read by Jews in Judaism before understanding how it plays out in the life of the church. That to, to miss the understanding of the role that the Jews and Judaism play in their relationship with Jewish literature, Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament, is to miss many of the cues that should be in the text. So they write a, a document called The Jewish People and Their Sacred Scriptures. In fact, when I met with, the first time I met with, um, with Wotia in uh, 1989, he did something remarkable, which he continued to do throughout his life. He never referred to the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Never once. Whenever he wanted to refer to the Torah, the writings, and the prophets, he called it the Hebrew word mikra, that which is written, using a Jewish term for, because he didn't want to be called, he didn't want it to be called the Old Testament because that implied that it had been abrogated. He didn't want to call it the Hebrew Scriptures because he felt that he too had an attachment to it. So throughout his life, throughout his pontifical life, he re referred to that text as the Mikra. It was a remarkable statement. It took many years before the church itself could speak about guilt or complicity in the acts of violence against Jews throughout its history and especially during the Second World War. But there was a signal act that Wotia did, which really showed the Jewish world and really showed others, especially the Catholic Church, how much the church had changed and how much Wotia himself had changed. Remember in the Jubilee year, the year 2000, the Pope makes a pilgrimage to Israel. He visits Yad Vashem, he visits other places, but the most remarkable act that he does occurs at the Western Wall. The Western Wall, you know, was the retaining wall for where the temples, the first and the second temple, stood. It's not the wall of the temple. Don't, most people call the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall the wall of the temple. It's not. It's the outside wall of the precincts where, where Jesus overturned the cart with the money changers. That was, that's where this took place. So Watia goes up and stands in front of the walls and prays. And like many people who vi visit the Western Wall, many Jews believe that that's where God's essence is still found, so they'll write a note, a petek. They'll write a note, a prayer, and they'll fold it up and they'll place it in the cracks of the wall, hoping that, that God will receive it. Well, Tia goes and leaves a prayer at the wall. I'm gonna read it to you, and I want somebody to tell me what's missing. It is a remarkable statement. I quote, God of our fathers, you chose Abraham and his descendants to bring your name to the nations. We are deeply saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused these children of yours to suffer. And asking your forgiveness, we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people 
of the covenant. Jonas Paulus II. What's missing? I'll give you a hint. Monsignor Breen ended his prayer with it. What's missing? No. Amen simply means, by the way, amen is a Hebrew word which means I concur or ditto. Amen is what, you, if somebody pronounces a blessing and you didn't get a chance to say it and you say amen, that's, that's theological ditto. That's what amen is. That's not it. Yeah, somebody in the back. Bingo. In the name, in the spirit of Christ our Lord, or in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, this is the first official papal document in history that was ever signed without that clause. Because Wotia, he was an actor. He understood that every single gesture made sense and communicated something. If he had signed it that way, the Jewish community would have had a difficult time understanding that request for forgiveness. But simply signing it, Jonas Paulus II, without that clause, he was not just speaking to his church. He was speaking to the Jewish people. It was a remarkable, remarkable act. I want to end with what are the challenges ahead. And I will list them for you. The first is validation, which means we are not yet at the point where we can reciprocally validate the other. It is very possible for the Christian church to look at the Jewish experience and to say, it is not what we follow, but is authentically a path to salvation. The Jewish community needs to work on that. The Jewish community does have a tough time. I grew up at a time, my beloved grandfather, who served in an indigent population in the South Bronx for the better part of his life, loved everybody, served everybody. And yet, if he was walking down the street in front of a church, he would cross the street. He would not walk in front of a church. He was afraid. I grew up understanding that from his point of view. So within the Jewish world, it's going to take time for us to learn to validate the Catholic Church and the Christian experience as an equal passage to salvation in a way that we can have dialogue on parallel. Unfortunately, one of the great Jewish leaders who died shortly after the Second Vatican Council, Rav Soloveitchik, said the Jews are, in, are allowed to engage in dialogue with the Christian church so long as it accrues to the security benefit of the Jewish people. Meaning, if that dialogue will lead to fewer Jews being persecuted, the dialogue's okay. But, he chided, don't talk theology. When I was the program chair of the International Liaison Committee in 1990, I'm the first chairperson who suggested that it was time for us to engage in theological dialogue. And much to the horror of some of my Jewish comrades, we did discuss it and we began. So we're wor working towards a way that we can now talk to one another on a parallel. So the act of validation in both directions is an incredibly important challenge that's still before us. Two, one of the things that I'm trying to address in my class here, hermeneutics, understanding the way we refer and understand our texts. We all bring our baggage to when we engage in sacred texts, but it's not just emotional and theological baggage. There are ways that Jews read Jewish literature. We don't read just the surface. We don't say the Bible says without reading how generation after generation after generation of rabbinic scholarship added to that discussion and tried to reframe that discussion. 
It is not enough to, for us to simply quote a text. We have to look at all of the successive generations of the interpretive tradition. In like manner, the Catholic Church cannot read your sacred literature without patristic literature and interpretive in interpretive um, text, you also bring philology and all other things to bear when you try to uncover the meaning of the text. We need to learn to understand how the other reads the texts. Same thing with, with Islamic literature, by the way. There is a his, Islamic hermeneutic, though most people will say you simply quote the Quran unless you're reading it without, without understanding Kisis al Ambaya and other interpretive tradi uh, traditions, you don't understand the Quran. So we need to understand each other's hermeneutics. Three, the challenge of covenant. Unfortunately, when you say covenant and I say covenant, we're not defining it in the same way. In fact, in a, in a, a Christian reading, if you read Greek and if you read the Septuagint and you look at every instance in which the word for covenant is used, 90% of the time, what is implied is the imposition of one will establishing an ordinance, meaning God establishing an ordinance, that the covenant is a unilateral pronouncement. God says, and this is what it is. Whereas the Hebrew term breed can never be interpreted as a unilateral statement. There is no such thing as a unilateral covenant or contract in Jewish law. It is bilateral. So in terms of our understanding of Brit, believe it or not, God and the Israelite people are on equal footing. If they are not on equal footing, that covenant cannot exist. So our understanding of covenant is different, and we need to learn from one another in order to hear one another better. Finally, mission. Mission, as you understand it, is the conversion from false gods and idols to the one true God. But how do we in the Jewish community hear that when you talk about mission? And are we afraid, sometimes, that maybe despite Nostratate, mission means us as well, one way or another. And so we need to work through these these challenges. So what are the real current realities? Especially for my friend Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, who I met with a bunch of times before he was pope and several times since he's been pope. There are some real challenges for the church ahead from his seat, from the Holy See. The first, as he sits in Rome and he looks out from his window, he sees the growing secularization of Europe. And that frightens him. And so therefore, in order to counter that, one can understand in the last 10 years or so, his outreach to the more traditional elements of the church that Wotia and others were willing to say need to be separate from the church. The followers of, of Pope Pius X, for example, who Wotia had excluded and Benedict has brought back in because he wants conservative, arch-conservative foot soldiers in the fight against the growing secular, secularization that's going on in front of his own window. The second, and I'm gonna talk about this in a second, the Islamification of Europe. And here's what I wanna say about the church's relationship with Islam. You have on your sheet the third paragraph of Noshkratate. Take it home and read it. But I'll give you the clue. It's really simple. The church has not yet figured out how to deal with the Muslim world. It has not. It would love to, but it can't figure it out. And all you need to do is look at the gaffes, unfortunately, perpetrated by Benedict in several different times when he reached out to the Muslim community. It was clear he did not understand them because he did things that offended them and said things that offended them. And that evinces a lack of knowledge of the people that you want to encounter in dialogue. And if you want to encounter people in dialogue, you have to learn about them first. And the, the Pope is very afraid of the Muslim world. He really doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand the diversity of it. 
There are at least 136 denominations of Islam. He doesn't understand the difference between geographic manifestations and just particular theological manifestations of Islam. And he doesn't understand how to speak to the Islamic world yet. He's working on it. But it's a real challenge for him. And the third is the growth, look at the change of the growth centers in the Catholic world. You know, it used to be Europe and America. It's not true anymore. Where is the Catholic Church growing fastest? Pacific Rim, India, Pakistan, Africa, South America. Number one, places where there are very few Jews, which means that Noshka Tate, fourth, fourth paragraph, is going to be taught less, not more, because fewer people are going to find any need for it. But more importantly, you have a whole new generation of church leadership that's going to emerge from South America, from South Africa, from Africa, from the Pacific Rim, from India, from Pakistan, who are now populating seminaries, are being brought over here to America, are leading parishes, and have had, number one, certainly no understanding of the American culture, but certainly have absolutely no contact in their early years with the Jewish community. So therefore, what's the greatest challenge in these 46 years since the signing by Pope Paul VI of Nostra Aetate. Most people in the Catholic Church don't know it exists. 1965, when it was distributed, some people read the proceedings of the Second Vatican Council, but it wasn't highlighted. It was part of a whole big tome. Go to the library and check out the proceedings of the Second Vatican Council. It's a big book. It landed on many priests' desks, stayed there. Maybe thumbed through, not studied. So 46 years ago, the whole relationship between the Catholic Jewish world changed. Maybe it didn't that much. Because the challenge ahead is to let people know that this did change. And like manner, it needs to change with the Muslim world that we need to eradicate ignorance. We need to eradicate prejudice. We need to eradicate misunderstanding. 46 years later, the average Catholic in the pew and the average priest in the Paris couldn't tell you what was in Noscretate. And if you asked them what it was, they would tell you it's the newest pasta dish at the Olive Garden. <laughs> we, everyone here, needs to be part of the generation that will continue to speak about it so that we can be agents of making this world into the world it could and should be, a world where we can respect one another, where we can learn from one another, where we can not only acknowledge our differences but celebrate them. And that, I think, is what God's message for all of us. And I will really end with this note when I look out of my window, I don't see one kind of tree replicated, one kind of plant replicated, one kind of insect. There's a diversity of trees, of plants, of birds, of human beings. And as a believer, I believe the biblical text that says that God created this place. How that happened, well, we could discuss that. But I believe that God is the architect and the engineer of the world in which we live. And if I look out at that world and see this wild diversity that's in front of my eyes right now, I have to believe from the very core of my being that that was the intent of creation. God wanted it that way. If God wanted the world Catholic, God could have made the world Catholic. That's not the way the world is. And therefore, I go back to that text. And at the end of every day of creation, God says it was good. And at the last day of creation, God says it is very good. But God does not say it's done. And God says that we are created in God's image. And the only image that's portrayed in that first chapter of Genesis is God as creator. 
That's all we know about God. God creates. God says, and it happens. And we're created in God's image. Therefore, we are created to be creators. What does that mean? It means if we look out at the world and say it's very good, but it sure ain't perfect, then that's our job. God made us partners in that work. Our job is to look at this very good world in which we live. And every place where we can make it better, we have to be God's partners and make it better. And we do that by opening up our hearts, our souls, our minds to each other. We engage in dialogue and we say, thank God for the diversity of this world because it makes it a very interesting place. Thank you.